How many people enjoy all our Christmas decorations we got up? Isn't it awesome? I love, uh, I love what we did this year, how we take this uh, nice big blank walls here and put up something beautiful. Uh, we've had a lot of people taking pictures and selfies and all that cool stuff. So those will be up for the Christmas season, coming up in about, uh, I don't know how many weeks from now. But All right, here at New Life, the Christmas season is always a evangelistic season, an outreach season, a season when we can invite our friends and family and neighbors. It's outward focus. It's looking outward to see and to share that same never-ending love, never-changing love with those that are around us, those people that we know. And it's always been a very, very big evangelistic time. This year with COVID, it might look a little bit different. We're going to uh, see how things go over these next couple of weeks, uh, but we're still focused outward. We're still looking outward. We're still uh, trying to see how we can reach people, and we want that always to be a focus, uh, especially during uh, the, these next number of weeks leading up into Christmas time. What we're going to look at today, we're going to start a series centered around evangelism, centered around the idea of evangelism and looking outward and reaching outward. And that's going to be our focus for the next number of weeks. And we hope that it's going to be an encouragement to all of us, all the, all the church and all of the services, an encouragement to let's look outward. Let's see those people who are around us. Let's be encouraged in God's calling for us as Christians to reach out to people, to, to, to evangelize, to tell people about God's love, to encourage people to come close to Jesus and to invite people to come close to Jesus with us. I want to start today in John 10.10. 10. This is a verse I use it quite often and you probably are familiar with it. If you don't know the exact reference, you probably will remember the words. But it says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Obviously, that's the bad news. But the good news is, this is the words of Jesus. He says, I have come that they may have life. Everybody say life. Say it again, life. And not just life. It says life and that they may have it more abundantly. Not just life, not just Breathing in and out, in and out, in and out. Not just a, a beating heart, but the abundant life of Jesus. This is what Jesus came to do. He says, I have come that they may have life, that we may have life, and that we can expect that life in him. I have something here. I looked around my house. I don't have very many of these around my house. But this is, anybody can, can anybody see what this is? Anybody, can anybody see, that, see what that is? It's very simple. It's just a little rock. Okay, you see that? Can yeah, everybody see that? It's actually, I got this a number of years ago. It's actually a flint rock. This is a kind of rock that they would use um, to strike and to make fire. I got it, uh, yeah, a number of years ago, but I've kind of kept it with me over the years. But this is, this is a rock, okay? For, for all that we're going to talk about today, this is just simply a rock. Now, let me ask you guys, is this rock alive? No. Okay, the answer is no. How do you know that this rock is not alive? How do you know that there is no life in this rock? Anybody got an answer? Anybody? Okay, it can't walk. It can't move. All right. Yep, that's right. We can just leave it here. And if nobody touches it, I know that it's going to be here, you know, 100 years from now. If nobody does anything or, you know, nothing changes, it's still going to be here. Because that rock doesn't have life. It's not going to move. What are some other, what, what are some other things that this rock does not do? It doesn't grow. That's right. Okay, something that has life will grow. Okay, if I had a little puppy here. And, you know, I fed it and I, you know, gave it food and all that stuff. 
eventually over, you know, weeks and months, that puppy is going to get bigger and bigger. The evidence of life in that puppy is that it grows, right? This rock is going to be the same size, unless, you know, if someone breaks it or something like that, it gets smaller. This rock will never grow. There is no life inside this rock. All right? Does everybody, everybody agree with me? Anybody disagree? All right, good. We're all on the same page. Okay, very good. Um, the other thing that this rock does not do, this rock will never make more rocks. Right? This rock will never reproduce. Okay, if I had, you know, if I had uh, uh, two dogs, male and female, you know, they're going to make more dogs. That's a sign of life. Okay, but this rock, this rock is never going to grow. This rock is never going to make more rocks. We can just leave this one rock here, and that one rock will just be one rock forever and ever and ever. Even if you put two rocks side by side, it's not going to make a difference. You're still just going to have two rocks because there is no life. Evidences of life, growth, and movement, obviously, growth, movement, and reproduction. Those are evidences of life. Even if you have a tree, for example, the tree has life. You plant a tree and it starts to grow. It gets bigger if it's a healthy tree. If there's health, that tree is going to grow. If it gets all the nutrients and the water and all the stuff that it needs, that tree is going to grow. And then you put it in, you know, the right atmosphere and you put it with all the right other trees around it, that tree is also going to reproduce. Think about this. This is the, one of the ways that I think. If I had, let's say, let's say a coconut tree, okay? If I had a coconut tree in my backyard, I can look back through all of history, okay? We have this one coconut tree, but this one coconut tree did not just come up from the ground by itself. It didn't just sprout up all of a sudden. Before that coconut tree was there, there was a coconut that got planted, and that coconut became a coconut tree. And before that, there was another coconut from another coconut tree. You can trace it all the way back. You know, if you had time and you were available, you could, you could, you could, you could trace it all the way back to the very first coconut tree that God created in the Garden of Eden. You think about that. Because life produces more life, produces more life, produces more life. Way back... In the Garden of Eden, God created coconut trees. And now, those coconut trees became more coconut trees, more coconut trees. And through thousands of years, all the way till now, the coconut trees that we have now, they are a direct line back to the coconut trees that God created. It's a creation of God. Something that has life will reproduce. But there is also the creation of life uh, when God created. Same with dogs. Same with dogs or cows, you know. The cows that God created way back in the garden, okay, they had more cows and more cows, more cows, all the way until we have the cows that we have today. You know, there's many different uh, kinds of cows, colors of cows, but it's all, you can trace them all back to the cows that God created in the Garden of Eden. It's, it's amazing to think back that it's from the original creation of God. What we, see, what we see now, every living thing that we see now, every living thing that we see now comes from God's original creation. And what happens when there is no reproduction, a species will die. You know, many years ago, there was a bird called the dodo bird. The dodo bird, and then they, they found it on some island, and eventually they all got killed off, and they weren't able to reproduce. And because they didn't reproduce, they all died off. And so where there is no reproduction, there is uh, the, the, the species passes away. <clears throat> a tree will grow and a tree will reproduce. So same with cows, same with dogs, same with people, same with all other living things. And so growth and reproduction are evidences of life. If we look, okay, let me, let me read a couple of verses. This is from, is from Genesis chapter 1. 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, it says, And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. In verse 22, it says, God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. So God created and God said, Be fruitful and multiply, go and fill the earth, just like we see today, filled with trees and, and the skies are filled with birds and the oceans and rivers are filled with, uh, filled with fish and, and creatures and you look on the land, it's all creation. There was that initial creation, but then God said, be fruitful and multiply. And that was God's command to all of creation. And later on in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 28, God said to Adam and Eve, same thing, be fruitful and multiply. Living things were meant to reproduce. Every living thing was meant to reproduce. It's a sign of life. But not only that, it's God's command. And, and when we see uh, in, in, in the Bible that God talked to man, God gave them a covenant. God gave different people covenants in the Bible. And in almost every instance when there was a covenant, one of God's promises, he told the people, he said, be fruitful and multiply. We see with Noah in Genesis chapter 9, he said, be fruitful and multiply. He said to Abraham in Genesis 15, your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky. The same with Isaac in Genesis 26 and Jacob in Genesis 35. Even to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God said, your descendants, he said, go, fill the earth, be fruitful and multiply. This is God's command not only to creation but to people uh, people to, to us as well reproduction is also a part of every covenant that God gave to man in the Bible so what does this mean for us in our spiritual lives just like something that is alive we read John, uh, John chapter 10 verse 10 at the beginning that we would have life and abundant life more life more abundantly just like natural life, so in the spiritual, God gives us spiritual life so that we can grow as an evidence of our life. And that growth will mean growth in our understanding of God, growth in our understanding of his never, 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 ever, ever ending faithful love. We grow in our understanding of that. We grow in our character. But also, as we grow, that is an evidence of spiritual life. But the other evidence of spiritual life is reproduction. And, and reproduction, is, it just means, you know, telling people about God. Reproducing that life that God has put within us in the lives of other people. People all around you need hope. People all around you need joy. People all around you need purpose for living. People all around you need freedom from fear. All of those things that you have experienced in your Christian life is what those people around you need. And God's desire for us is that we would reproduce that life that is within us, reproduce that life in other people around us. And so... It means being bold. It means talking to people about, about their situation, the hope that we have. When you talk to someone and they, you know, they're, they're, they're having difficulties in life or you know, they're, they're not getting along with their spouse or, or they're having problems at work, we have the source of hope. We have life within us through Jesus Christ. And God's desire is that we would bring that life into other people's lives as well. Let me read a couple of verses here just as we get ready to close. In Matthew chapter 9. We're going to read uh, Matthew chapter 9 verse 36. 
And, and it says, Jesus was traveling with his disciples. He was talking to the multitudes and telling them and teaching them like he did. In verse 36, it says, When Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Do you guys remember that word compassion from a number of weeks ago? That word compassion we used when we were talking about the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, he saw the guy who was beat up and was ready to die. The Good Samaritan went out of his way, but he was moved with compassion. And because of that compassion, he helped. And so that same word, compassion, is what they use for Jesus here. Jesus was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. But this is what Jesus did with his compassion. Listen to this. He said to his disciples, he said, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He said, look, there's such a huge harvest here. There's such a huge need here. There was a need. He saw their need with compassion. And he said, there's such a huge need here. Pray. He says, therefore, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into his harvest. So that was God's, that was Jesus' answer for what was going on in the multitudes. He said to his disciples, pray. Now, that's the end of chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9. Verse 38, that's the end of chapter 9. But I want you to know that that is not the end of the story. When they wrote, when, when Matthew wrote the book of Matthew, there was no chapters, there was no verses. And so we can read into chapter 10. And it's just a, one continuing story here. So in verse 38, he says, Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And, okay, so this is uh, verse 1 from chapter 10. And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And then verses 2 to 4 talks about all the names of the twelve apostles. In verse 5, it says, Then these twelve Jesus sent out. So we see what happened here. Jesus saw the multitudes with compassion. He said to his disciples, Pray that God would send laborers into the harvest. And then number three, what does he do? He sends out his disciples. Jesus was answering his own prayer. He prayed. He said, Pray that God's going to send laborers. He said, now you, you're the ones who are going to go. You guys go. And so Jesus sends us out. He, doesn't wa he wants us to pray, yes, but he wants us to pray from a position of God, use me. God, send me. This is what God wants from all of us. This is what God expects from all of us. In Matthew, at the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, 19, it says, go into all, it says, it says, go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy. It says, go ye into all the world. You know, that's God's great commission for us. But it's also a sign of life. That it should just be something that's, that, that's normal in life. It, it doesn't have to be something where, you know, you you get up on stage and you're, you're, or you're standing on the street corner telling everybody about Jesus. No, it's just something that's natural. Let the love of God just flow through your life. Grow in him. Know him more. But let it just overflow into your relationships, into those people around you. Bring hope to the hopeless. Pray for the people who are sick. You know, I've never had anybody say to me when I've asked them if I can pray for them. I've never, I've, I've never had anybody say, no, please don't pray for me. I've never had that ever happen. For Christians, for non-Christians, I've, I've asked people if I could pray. I've never had them say, please, no, please, I, I, I don't want you to pray for me. No, please don't. 
No, don't be, don't be weird and say, come up to everybody and say, hey, you know, can I pray for you? You know, you don't, you don't even know them. But talk to people. Get to know them. When you understand their needs, say, you know, I believe in God, and I believe in, in a God who does miracles. Can I pray for you? I'm going to believe that God's going to touch you right now. God's going to make a difference in your situation. I'm, I believe that God's going to do something that is unexpected, but he's going to enter into your life and into your situation, and we're going to see a change happen. You know, God loves to work on our behalf, especially, especially when we're being bold and sharing in faith with people who are around us. During this Christmas season, I just want to encourage each one of us, let's be bold in being those people who share our faith with other people, share the hope that we have, share the life and the love that we have, because God has given you something special. In each one of your lives, God has done something that's worth talking about, that's worth telling other people. How many people have a story about what God has done in your life? Oh, you could tell somebody. You could share a little bit of hope, share a little bit of joy, share a little bit of, you know, man, 2020 has been so bad, it's been so difficult, lots of stuff going on, it's uncontrollable, but I know a God who's above all, who knows all, who sees all, and he still loves us, and he's still got a great and wonderful plan for our lives. We can share hope, we can share life, we can share joy. Amen? How many would commit to doing that and look for opportunities to do that during this Christmas season? Yeah, let's do that together, okay? Let's all stand up. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the hope that we have in you. The hope of the world. Jesus, the Son of God who came into the world as a baby is what we celebrate during this Christmas season. And God, today we offer ourselves to you and we say, God, use me. Just tell God, just say, God, use me. Just tell him, say, God, use me. Open my eyes, open our eyes, God, to see the opportunities, to see the people who are around us, to, to speak into their lives, to offer that little bit of hope that they don't have the hope that they're missing, the hope that they're lacking, the love that they have never experienced. Use us, God, in that way in their lives. God, because the truth is, your love never, ever, ever gives up. And we want everyone to know about your great love for us. Use us during this time, God. We offer our lives unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Just lean in. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.